Oprah Winfrey is North America's first black billionaire and is considered by many to be the most influential woman in the world. She went from being born into poverty in rural Mississippi to a teenage single mother to now being worth $2.6 billion. Need motivation? Watch the top 10 with Believe Nation. Top 10, I got a top 10. Got my motivation high for my top 10. Gotta learn from the wise women and men. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael and I make these videos because you are probably the most ambitious person that you know, but you also know that you're capable of more and you get that push by surrounding yourself with the best. So today let's learn from one of the best, Oprah Winfrey and my take on her top 10 rules of success. Enjoy. Okay, let's kick it off with rule number one. Be the master of your own faith. There's a bigger dream waiting for you, just waiting for you to step into it to step into it. Your life is big. Your life is huge. And we spend so much time wanting to be in somebody else's life. And you don't get honored. You don't get revered. You don't get celebrating wanting what somebody else has. Because that which created you, divine intelligence that dreamed you from before your ancestors ever knew they would become your ancestors, that which dreamed the seed of you wants you to know how special, how wondrous, how mysterious, how complex, how glorious, how phenomenal you are. And you get no credit messing in somebody else's territory. Or trying to have power over something you have no control. Another one of my favorite teachings is the Wizard of Oz. When the witch, Wicked Witch of the West says, go away from here because you don't have any power here, you have no power in any territory other than your own. Oh, but you are the master of that. You get to be the master of your own fate. You get to be the captain of your own soul. And if you just manage that, if you just took care of your territory, oh, the glorious, 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 wondrous, wondrous opportunities and possibilities that are waiting for you. So the question is, what are you resisting? What are you pushing against? What are you not allowing? What are you blocking? Because you have this idea of who and what you're supposed to be. Instead of leaning into the dream that's already been created and waiting for you. It's waiting for you. And the second, I mean, it doesn't, it's an instant thing. It's a shift in the way you see yourself and the power from which you have come. Rule number two, stay in the light. And this is the thing, I think I have to just say, Please say. everybody is feeding yourself on the hysteria and the negativity. Talk you about gotta it. stay in the light. But one of the reasons why I was so excited is about A Wrinkle in Time, because the message is that the darkness is spreading so fast these days. You must become a warrior of the light. And the reason that's so meaningful to me is because that's how I've led my whole life. And every moment in that film, I just felt like, I'm just saying what I yeah. normally say. It's true. <laughs> and, I, and, and, and for these times, the darkness is there to show you your light. Look at what has happened. So if you put the focus on, look at what happened with the darkness that showed up in Parkland and the darkness that showed up on the streets of Ferguson and the darkness that showed up in many, 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 many homes in Chicago with shootings and uh, senseless murders. It brings out the best in people. It brings out the best. And so that's what it's there. We live on a planet where there is darkness and light. Rule number three, cultivate a spiritual life. I teach them that there is no life without cultivating a spiritual life. 
because you are first and foremost a spiritual being having a human experience. And if you lose sight of that, it's easy to get lost in the world and no one can save a world that they're lost in when they've lost sight of their own North Star. So having a spiritual life actually means actively and ritually creating the space in your life all the time for gratitude, for kindness, for empathy, for inspiration, for joy, and for reverence for life in the home of your soul first. And then working to spread that inner joy outward. It means slowing down, it means taking in the moment, it means being exactly where you are, not distracted somewhere else. It means knowing who you are and getting about the business of fulfilling why you really came to our planet. Rule number four, trust your instincts. I started feeling like, I think everybody knows I've, I've moved my whole life on instinct, you know? I feel like now it's time to let the show go. I feel like it's time to move on because I've grown as much as I can grow. When I've grown as much as right. I can grow in a space, that's my instinct to move. Also, if you wanna have unstoppable confidence and self-love, check out my 254 series, they're free. The links to join are in the description below. Figure out where your power base is. Your number one job is to become more of yourself and to grow yourself into the best of yourself. Become so skilled, so vigilant, so flat out fantastic at what you do that your talent cannot be dismissed. Rule number five, push through difficult times. I went through some tough times after, after I left the Oprah show. I made a conscious decision that I did not want to be sitting on TV with the Oprah show and y'all saying, she should have left that show. That show was really good two years ago. I made a conscious decision, decision that when I felt I had said all that I could say and the audience had heard it, that I would move on and that I would not spend my life regretting or trying to hold on to what used to be or hold on to what I had. So I dreamed this dream of starting a network. And in the beginning, it was, it was a struggle. It was a struggle because I didn't, I, honest to goodness, I did not know what I was doing. I was trying to figure it out. I was trying to figure it out. I thought that the Oprah show audience would follow us to own, and then I realized y'all didn't have cable. And if you had cable, you did not have the own package. So, so it took me a minute. And unlike most people who you get to have your mistakes in private, some don't go right in your life, you get to sulk about it in private. If I make a mistake, it's on the CNN crawl or the CNN news. So when I was in the climb and there were so many wonderful owners, I see Churl Action Jackson here. There were so many wonderful owners, people who said, oh, we're going to stand with you. We're going to stand by you. Thank you, Roland Martin. There were so many people who said, listen, we believe that this can happen. So I dreamed the dream along with Tyler Perry, who was my friend who came to me and said, Tyler, Tyler said, I'm going to help you out because Tyler can go home and write a script and direct it, produce it, and shoot it and do it for less money than anybody in Hollywood. So we started with the foundation of have and have nots. If loving you is wrong, love thy neighbor, Mama Hattie. And then I started to dream another dream about scripted television because in the beginning I was told you couldn't do it. You couldn't do it, didn't have enough money to do it. And I dreamed the dream. I read Proverbs 11:28 that says, those who trust in their riches will fall, but the righteous will rise and thrive like a green leaf. Rule number six, become the best version of yourself. It is your job to make yourself whole. Not perfect, but whole. 
and full. Your real work in life, your real work, is to fill yourself till your cup runneth over so that you're never grasping and needy, clamoring and insecure. But to, you can live your life assured in your worthiness and your right to be here and to become the best version of yourself as a woman being. Rule number seven, don't be ashamed of your past. You came from very modest circumstances. You didn't come from a wealthy family. Well, modest is not the word. Well, I was trying to be polite. I, I mean, I was, I was actually poor. And I, you know, a lot of the girls at my school, actually all the girls from my school are poor. And I was saying to them just recently, I was just in South Africa for a graduation, you know, you all are come, come from the same circumstances. You were poor. And one of the girls raised her hand and said, I don't like using that word. I go, well, if you're not poor, then you should excuse yourself because that's why I'm paying for right. you because you're in the right. school. <laughs> so if you're not poor, you don't like the choice of the word. So I don't, I don't have a problem with the word. I don't have any shame about it. I think, you know, probably earlier in my life or career, the word would have bothered me. But it truly, it was, it, it, it was, I was poor. No running water, David, or electricity, wow. living with an outhouse. Okay, yeah. that's poor. Rule number eight, establish meaningful connections. You can't get what you want by focusing on what you don't want. This is about the need to establish as many meaningful connections as we can. If we're going to save the world, we have to find a way to connect to each other, to connect to the nature that we're killing, to animals, to history, to an acknowledgement of the lingering trauma of racism and sexism. We need to connect to the people we love and mean something to us, and more than that, to the people who don't. That doesn't mean we always have to agree with another person's philosophy. It means we, if we're going to continue to survive and thrive on this planet, have to find ways to transcend the politics of division and embrace the places that bond us where we find our human ground. Rule number nine, surrender to the dream. Everybody works hard and everybody has their own dreams. There, is, there was a time where I used to spend a lot of energy wanting things, wanting things. Of course, it's easy for me to say, oh, things don't define you because I got a lot of things. Things are nice, I like them. But this is what I learned. When you can surrender to the dream, you get to live in the space of the higher power. You get to live in the space that you purposefully have come to earth to claim for yourself. So, around 1984, I was sitting in bed one morning uh, Sunday morning, should have been in church, but I wasn't. I was reading the New York Times review of The Color Purple. And I thought, whoa, this sounds like a really great book. I got out of bed in my pajamas, put on my galoshes, and went to the store to get the copy of The Color Purple. I read The Color Purple in one afternoon, got, went back to the bookstore, bought every book of The Color Purple. I took the books to, to the office and I said to everybody, y'all got to read this book. Oh my God, you got to read this book, Color Purple. I needed a book club. I didn't have one. Uh, so I pass out the book to everybody I knew. Please read the Color Purple, read the Color Purple. Then I start to hear that somebody's going to do a movie about the Color Purple. But I don't know anybody in the movie business. By this time, I was on AM Chicago. I don't know anybody. I start praying to God. God, please help me find a way to get into Color Purple. I say, Jesus, I don't even have to have a speaking part. I will be, because I went to the movies and I saw on the movie credits, at the last credit, there's something called Best Boy. So I said, Jesus, if you just let me be Best Girl, that'd be all right by me. I can be Best Girl. I can carry the script. I can help the people with the water. I can do whatever. So I start praying for the color purple. As, as divine law would have it, Quincy Jones comes to Chicago and he is in Chicago for one half of a day because somebody has filed a suit against Michael Jackson claiming that Billie Jean was their lover and that's not his song. 
So Quincy had taken the red eye to Chicago. He was in his hotel room. He was coming out of the shower and the television in his hotel room is on AM Chicago. There sits little chubby me with my Jerry curl on AM Chicago. Quincy Jones tells Reuben Cannon, the casting agent, I think I found Sophia. So I get a call from Reuben Cannon who says, I'm calling about a movie. It's called Moon Song. Would you be interested to come and audition? And I say, I have not been praying for Moon Song. <laughs> no. I had not been playing for Moon Song. I've been praying for the color purple. He said, Well, I think you should come and, and, and audition. So I go to audition. You know, movie people, they're making everything all secret. Steven Spielberg didn't want anybody to know he was doing color purple. So on the outside of the script, it says Moon Song. But I know all the words by heart. So when I open the script, I know this is the color purple Jesus. This is the color purple. Yes. So I auditioned for The Color Purple. I can't even believe it. They don't just want me to be the water girl or the best girl. They are asking me, do I want a part in the movie? Oh, that, if that, I'm thinking prayer. Prayer works. Prayer works. But listen to this. Three months pass. Three months is a long time. I auditioned in February. March, April, May comes. I haven't heard anything. So I call Reuben Cannon. I say, Mr. Cannon, I'm sorry, sir. I haven't heard anything. I expected to hear something by now. And Reuben Cannon, African-American man, says to me, you don't call me. I call you. And I didn't call you. Do you understand that I have real actresses who have auditioned for this part? Real actresses. And he tells me who just left his office. And I went, well, okay, I'm not getting that part. So I hang up the phone and I start crying. I can't believe that God has played this trick on me. I think, this is a trick. So I decide that this is because the fat has finally caught up with me. The fat has finally caught up with me, and now I must get rid of the fat in two weeks. I am going to go to a fat farm, and I'm going to lose 25 pounds. I'm going to drink a lot of green juice. I'm going to have some cleanses and colonics. So I... I, I also was trying to make peace with it. I said, God, I don't understand. I thought it was for me. You ever had that talk with God? I, I, I thought it was for me. I thought it was for me. God, you let me audition with somebody named Harpo. That's my name backwards. Jesus, that was a sign. Wasn't it a sign? And then three months pass, and then, then Reuben Cannon says, real actresses have just left his office. So I start to pray on the track. I'm out on the track at the fat farm, and I am running around at the track at the fat farm. It starts to rain. Y'all know how that is but I don't even care because I am praying to God to help me to let it go. Help me let it go because now I've become obsessed with it and it's now controlling my life. I start praying, running around the track. And I keep hearing this noise and I... I can't, there's nobody on the track but me, and I'm running around the track. And I look around, and it is my thighs rubbing together. It's my thighs.
My thighs are rubbing together, causing this thunderous sound. There's nobody on the track. So then I really start to cry. Oh, Lord, help me. Help me let it go. Help me let it go. Help me let it go, God. Help me let it go. And you ever did this prayer where you say, okay, Lord, okay, I'm going to let it go. Then you get up and you go, well, I think I still got a little bit of it. I did. Help me let it go. But I am not going to be able to see the other actress in my part. I won't be able to see it. I won't be able to see Color Purple. Just can't never see it the rest of my life. I won't be able to see it. So then I started... I don't know where it came from. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. I sang and I cried. I sang and I cried and I prayed some more until... I could reach the point where not only, not only will I be able to go to the movie, but I can bless the other actress. I can bless her. I can say, I bless you. I bless you. I bless you with this. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my Blessed Savior, I surrender all. And I tell you in my greatest testimony that the instant I laid that thing down, I'm telling you, when I laid it down, when I laid it down and it didn't have me anymore. It had no control over me anymore. I didn't feel anything about it anymore. When I let it go, when I intentionally surrendered it to the power that was greater than I could ever know. The instant that happened, a woman comes running out of the cafeteria, screaming, Ofri? Is your name Ofri? For 10 years, nobody could pronounce my name. I said, yeah, she said, somebody's on the telephone for you. He said, name Spielberg. I get to the phone. He says, I hear you're at a fat farm. I said, no, sir. This is a health retreat. He says, I'd like to see you in my office in California tomorrow. This, this was in Wisconsin, I was. I'd like to see you in my office. And if you lose a pound, you could lose this part. No problem do I have. I'll have no problem not losing a pound. So, honey, I packed my bags and I stopped at the Dairy Queen. I got three scoops just in case I'd lost a half a pound. <laughs> and the next day, I was in Steven Spielberg's office and he said, you're hired. You're hired. And rule number 10, the last one before a very special bonus clip, is have fun. Oprah, I'm dying to know what is in your purse. I'm not quite sure myself. 
Okay, so somebody's gonna bring out my purse. <laughs> this is this is Kelly Herleman who dresses me every day. So this is this uh, this is uh Who did, who did a real good job today, except I said to her, I think these boots are size nine, and I wear size 10. But they look so cute, though. But I look cute, but damn, my feet hurt. Okay. Okay, hold it. Hey, no, no, Kelly, just stand here. I don't know. This is the bag I was carrying this morning. It was right. Where'd you find this? Um, oh, hey, boy. Upstairs, in the closet, on okay. the table. On the table. Okay. This is what's in my purse right now. Um, okay, so there's my little makeup bag. Okay, that's cute. All in one bag. This was given to me by Nate Burkett. Uh, then there's, the, then there's, my, there's my wallet. There's my um, Blackberry. This is the color purple. Uh, Y'all should go see that. I saw that the other night. Now, these are the sunglasses that Ellen got. I carry a black pair and a brown pair because you never know what you're going to be wearing. This is uh, contact lens cleaning fluid. This is... Uh, uh, <laughs> Charger for my Blackberry. Uh, this is a uh, movie, Freedom Land. This is a, uh, oh, this is great. This is a poem my Angela just is going to do at the White House. And, uh, okay, what is this? Oh, this is, uh, this is, uh, this is my Angela's itinerary, so I know where she is. And uh, that's about it. Okay, what I would like to know is, oh, I got some pens down here. And then some glasses, reading glasses. And I got, um... Sophie's ball, just whenever we're playing. She only likes the clear ones. And uh, that's it. Okay, let's see how much money do I have in my wallet. Okay, got receipts. I keep those for you when I was shopping the of other course. day. Then I got, this is how much money I got. Pull out all my money. Here we go. Yeah, I have a wallet. I have South African rands. Rand. And hold on. $2. It's bad. Wait a minute. Oh, oh, no, there's more. There's more money. Okay, there's more. There's more money. There's 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Now I've got a special bonus clip from Oprah on how to learn from your mistakes that I think you're gonna enjoy. But before that, it's time for the question of the day. I wanna know, what are your instincts telling you that you need to trust? Let me know what they are. Put them down in the comments below. And if you made it this far in a video, you're still here watching, give me a hashtag believe down in the comments below. I wanna celebrate you. We don't just watch videos here, we do something about it. So give me that believe in the comments below too. When did you realize in Chicago or Baltimore that you actually had a skill as an interviewer that was really better than anybody else's? And where do you think that skill came from? I never thought it was better than anybody else's. What I do think I have that is really uniquely my own is my ability to connect to the audience. Because my skill comes not from my interviewing ability, my skill comes from my listening ability, and my skill comes from me knowing fundamentally inside myself that I am no different than the audience. So what gave me the power in the seat and the power with the microphone was I always saw myself as the surrogate for the audience. So I would ask people questions that I would not normally ask. I mean, I asked some really embarrassing, que uh, embarrassing question ones, not because I wanted to know the answer, but because I thought the audience did. And then I thought, well, I'm not going to ask what the audience wants the next time. And when I get in that situation, it was a, it was a, I, I put myself in a bad situation. I asked Sally Field when she was dating Burt Reynolds. I asked, remember this, Gail? I asked Sally Field, did Burt sleep with his toupee on? <laughs> what was the answer or the question? <laughs> and I would never do that today. I wouldn't do it. Because I was doing it because I was getting pushed by the producers like, people want to know, people want to know. So I was thinking I was doing it on behalf of the audience. She shut down, and I could see that it embarrassed her, and I never got another Thank thing you. from her. So I thought, okay, that, that was wrong. I learned from that.
Hey, if you want more top 10 rules videos, they are no longer on this channel. I have a dedicated brand new channel just for them. If you want to check it out, go subscribe. The link is right there next to me. Lots of great content. Go there. Go check it out. <laughs> Continue to believe and I'll see you there.